for love once again. I'm a big big girl. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hello and welcome to Big Week. Big Week is a series that examines the life of lawyers who are not into litigation. Lawyers that have made a name for themselves in the niche area of the law that they have excelled in. For lawyers, there are so many things you can do without being a litigator. You can go into technology. You can be a corporate lawyer in the strict sense of somebody who advises corporations on corporate law matters. Mm -hmm. Or you can be the kind of advisor who provides advice on business law matters. There's, there are so many options in growing. Yes, you can advise a company. Yes, you can decide you are going to be the gas lawyer of the future. You can think about technology in the power sphere. You don't have to be a litigator to do any of these things. All you have to do is to be able to understand the law and apply it. I'm a liar, but I don't even go to court. My daily moves. Hello and welcome to another episode of The Big Week. Today, our guest is the very personification of the word Big Week. She is the other half of the partnership of UUBO, Dodoma and Bello Sadi. Ladies and gentlemen, help me welcome Dr. Maima Ajua Bello Sadi. Is this what you've always wanted to do? Uh, you know, people say, oh, I was born to be an actor. I always wanted to be on television, mm -hmm. whether I was an actor or not, but I just told my mom I was going to be on television. Mm -hmm. uh, is this what you've always wanted to do or you stumbled at law? I think in a sense, yes. Um, having briefly thought I might be an actress, which I was obviously hopeless at, but anyway, <laughs> I, I think yes. Um, and, and what are the reasons for that? As an art student of my generation, I mean, I'm heading for 70, so you can figure that one out, but as an art student of my generation, you tended to think if you're gonna be a professional, you'll be a lawyer. Uh, I knew I'd be reasonably good at it. I think I write reasonably well. I don't necessarily speak well before a court or, you know, I didn't really ever see myself as a litigator but I knew I could be a relatively good lawyer. I enjoyed reading. I enjoyed kind of making arguments that made sense, being mm -hmm. logical about things. And I enjoyed um, trying to explain things to people. I, I, I like being able to give people clear explanations of what things might be or not be as the case might be. So I, I, I think I felt I'd be a lawyer. And I was very supported, I think, by the fact that my parents also felt this was a good profession. And weirdly, my father in particular, before his time, kept saying, well, the good thing about this is it's something that you can do at home. You know, assuming you're married, you can still work from home. When you're retired, you can still do a few things. So he, he had this sense in his head of some something that clearly has happened in recent years where we're all working from, from home. home. Yeah. Realize that actually it's, it's, it's very doable. So for a generation of women, I think it's certainly something that is uh, important to remember. In my mind's eye, I see the image of, of old lawyers mm -hmm. when I was a baby. It was them in their little chambers at home mm -hmm. because they consulted at home as well or they read at home Absolutely. as well. Um, you've talked about you getting support. Did, how did you end up practicing here? Mm -hmm. Did you get married before you started practicing here or did you found yourself in Nigeria okay. before? Short version. <laughs> <laughs> I think we're going to take the abridged version. The abridged version. <laughs> uh, yes, I, I got married and then I obviously was going to have to work here. I, I must confess that when I first came, because I had done a doctorate, I assumed I would practice as well as teach. And I, I actually made an effort to do that. I, I went to the University of Lagos at the time and made inquiries and I was told that they didn't want part-time teachers. Either I was going to be a full-time lecturer or nothing. So I thought, great, let me just go and practice law and you know, make my profession in that, in that respect. So that's what I ended up doing. 
when you came to Nigeria, did you start with corporate law immediately or? Immediately, yeah, immediately. I came knowing that I was um, going to be a, a partner of Senator Joe Dama at the time. I'd met him, I mean, okay. obviously I visited when I first met my husband, met his friends. Uh, it came up, you know, what are you thinking of doing? He was thinking of going into private practice. I got on well with him, you know, he was somebody I found, found easy to chat to. We had similar views on what a law firm of the future should look like. So when I finally came, having been married, um, I knew that that was exactly what I was going to do. And we were very clear that we were going to be corporate lawyers. His history, I think he had a very brief moment of litigation himself, but his history was essentially as what used to be called a solicitor but as somebody who did not do litigation or as a corporate lawyer. Let me just jump on that. What do you think about the separation of, of, of barristers and solicitors in England and we haven't adopted? Mm -hmm. what's, what's your view of that? I'm actually glad that we didn't. I, I, I like the, the fused profession. I like the ability to move from one into the other. I haven't done it myself, but I think it's a great option for people. I, I appreciate the fact that it's not a bad thing to be very specialized, yeah. but I also think sometimes you can almost over specialize. Yeah. Um, I like the fluidity of being at a fused bar, so I appreciate it, although it was not something that I knew I was going to move from one to the other, but I, I think it's good for people to have that possibility. Did you train in England? Or... I didn't. I'm very much a product of Ghana and then um, Having done my first degree in Ghana, I went to the United States. But there I only did a master's and then a doctorate eventually. As I said, thinking I was going to be a teacher. Earlier on when we were talking, we talked about your daughter Kumi. Is she, is she the only one interested in law? Or, um... <laughs> Again, slightly amusing. No, I have uh, four children, um, three girls and a boy. And all the girls actually have done law. The first practiced law, um, she's taking some time out. She's having a baby, so she's taking time out. My second did law as well, but she was very clear that her whole purpose for doing law was to understand when she really needed to employ a lawyer. She's a business person and she's like, you people charge too much. I just want to know at what point do I really need you? <laughs> so that's the reason why I'm doing law. So that, that was her thing. <laughs> My third daughter, the one I was just mentioning as having returned, is very much what I would call a lawyer's lawyer. She is somebody who is likely to be an academic. She's very interested in understanding the nuances of the law. What are the things that can change a judgment? What are the things that can be made to enforce somebody's rights better? That's, that's her. My son, I think, will, like his sisters, perhaps do law, but he's, if he's doing it, he's going to do it with something else. He's more inclined to do an MBA, I would say. Um, but if he does, he will likely do it as a GD MBA. You know, in the American system, you can do that. And I'm, I'm a fan of making sure that every young person does a first degree in law mm -hmm. and thereafter you can you can sort of choose what you, you, really, you, want. You, you want to do especially um, in, in, in a world now that you know the, all the lines are so blurred. technology mm -hmm. has sort of you know uh, given shrunk the entire world you know? absolutely um, absolutely but you're right because when you think about it apart from the the discipline of law you know the ability to think logically and to understand or let's put it this way a lawyer should be able to think clearly understand absorb clearly you know learn things fast that that discipline is great for almost any profession when you think about it but in addition that because law is so fundamental mm. to any society it's it's actually something that really we should all absorb at various levels we may not choose to practice we may not even necessarily be lawyers, but as you would understand, the rule of law is really important. We're unlikely to have equality in life, but equity, the ability to feel that I'm a small groundnut farmer in the middle of God knows where, and when I have a problem, I can go to court and be heard. That's right. That's vital. And I, I think part of 
what one might call the anger of many nowadays is that they don't have that option. They don't feel. They don't, they don't feel. feel like, yes, you can be heard. Yes, to the access to justice. Yeah. When you were starting out, you know, here in Nigeria, mm. what was it like? Did you? get the support of people or was it you just found yourself as a, as a lone ranger in, 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 in this uh, uh, corporate uh, law? Well, because I started out as in a partnership in effect, I had initial support, but I, I guess one thing that many people don't realize when they look at Udoma and Belosagi now is that Senator Udoma has actually been away for a very long time. He um, left relatively early in our partnership to go and join his wife who was working in Paris. I'm a woman. I was never going to quarrel with that approach. I'd have been mm -hmm. thrilled if my husband had decided to go with me when I was being moved to a different jurisdiction to go and work. She was working with um, Elf at the time. And he went because he wanted to make sure he was with his family. He worked while he was there, so I was running the law firm for a while. He came back and then he took off into politics and ended up spending a significant amount of time there. Yes, yes. And I think sort of literally just before we retired, I tease him that it's just so he can say he retired from UBO. He came back briefly and then took off again. But it, it, it meant that I was in a sense responsible for, even if not directly running, um, Udodoma and Bello Sagi for quite a long period of time. And um, I, I think therefore that my support may not have been as direct as others might have wanted or as I would have wanted, but I did have some support from my husband, obviously, from, from, from people who might even be regarded as competitors. You know, um, the, the, there was a law firm, Ajumogobi Okeke, who we, I happen to know the partners not very well, but you know, when I had a problem, I was pretty much on my own, so I'd run down the road to go and ask them, well, you know, how have you handled this or is this a problem? Because I was operating in an environment where I hadn't grown up. My network was initially Udoma's network my husband and his family network. I had to make my own. So sometimes there are challenges around that and sometimes you have to find people who you can access quickly and ask questions of. So in terms of support, I did get it. I had to build it, but I did get it. Because you were you were driving, you were in the driving seat more or less. Uh, a foreigner, uh, a wife, mm -hmm. and then a partner in a law firm in Nigeria. How did you, how, did, how were you able to stare all of that and, and build a, a partnership that has, you know, lasted and this, this long? Um, well, you always start by God's grace. Right? <laughs> <laughs> to God be the it glory. Nigeria movies. <laughs> we end up with but, that. But, but that is very, very mm. true. You know, even when you don't completely acknowledge it, a lot of stuff happens by God's grace. You know, prayers, kind of work, however, quietly. Um, and, and I will, I mean, I like to kind of say, yes, of course, I've done it well, but of course there were issues and challenges. And, you know, I sometimes look at my children and I say to them, do you think I was a good mother? And, uh, <laughs> you know, type of approach. I, I, and as they're arguing with me, my response to them is always, well, you survived, right? And you have come out pretty normal. You are not spoiled children and, you know, you haven't gone on drugs. And so what are you complaining about? But is that entirely fair to them? I don't know. Should I have spent more time with them? I, I, I probably should. So in a sense, the question is, did I do everything right? With my kids, mm -hmm. Fingers crossed, we shall see. We'll wait for that. We'll wait, for them. We'll, we'll wait to see what, what kind of parents will turn out to be themselves. With the law firm, I I think so. I think we, we made the right choices around partners, the right decisions about what we wanted to be. Um, we overcame the challenges and there were many and maybe I'll, I'll talk about them at some point. Um, even things like the decision to retire relatively early were very deliberate decisions because we were 
of the view that we should try and build institution, an institution. It, I think, you know, all countries, all, all countries are built on institutions of different kinds, whether it is at local government level, whether it's at corporate level, whether it's at federal level. And the strength of those institutions is often what guides the country or the corporation or whatever it is through. So we wanted to, in a sense, contribute by building an institutional entity that would be a strong one and provide um, a role model of a sort for, for others. Because remember that our history, I don't mind myself, is seeing, for the most part, relatively small chambers. You've mentioned sort of people going home and working from their homes, but these are people who individually had set up, you know, law firms that weren't, it was not clear would survive beyond them. They take people in, they train them, all being well, those firms would continue, but it wasn't obvious. And we wanted something where it was obvious from day one, that whether we were there or not, that law firm was going to continue. So I think as far as the law firm was concerned, I, I think we did a reasonably good job. And we were always happy to say that we're probably one of the longest continuing law firms at the moment. We have had our issues, obviously, but we've always managed to overcome them and, and, and stay together. And uh, I think the third part of your question, in a way, was being a wife. <laughs> um, extremely supportive husband. I, I, I cannot uh, fault him in any way, shape or form. He gave me absolutely all the support I required to the extent that if I was in the office at 2 a.m., and sometimes I was, you know, he'd employ security to come and sit outside the office and make sure that I got home. Very deliberate. He could afford it, we thank God. But, you know, to be not the kind of husband who'd be screaming and yelling about why aren't you home and I want you here, and that was not his thing. You've been to school, you've chosen to build a career, I'll support you in it. And uh, I pray that your end is good. That's almost the way he sees it. There is always a need for mentorship. Um, some people can adopt mentors from, from a distance. Uh, do you find yourself mentoring? Are you mentoring people directly, especially your, your female lives, being a uh, female? And do you deliberately do things in that direction, like mentor? Well, as you said, mentorship can be in many shapes and forms. So clearly when I was in the firm, I like to think that I mentored some of my female associates and so on and so forth. And to the extent that many of my partners are now female, I think I'd like to say that I can take a little bit of credit for that. I don't know whether it's completely true or not. Are there more female uh, partners? In, in We're about 50-50. Oh. It's a matter of pride for us. 50-50. Yes. <laughs> I mean, we're trying to obviously maintain the balance. Um, one of the things actually just says that, you know, we are beginning to worry about the fact that not that many men are staying in the law. I'm to be corrected on this. I think a lot of people are doing law, but I don't know if they're staying in because we have so many young men come in and they take off to do business or set up their own law firms, which is fine, and then move on to do politics and so on and so forth. So I am a little bit curious to see whether this is in fact, my, whether my sense is correct. We need a bit of data on that. I guess in a sense, I would say I'm a better corporate mentor than I am an individual one. I'm not entirely patient with people. With mentorship to work, you have to work at it. So if I'm prepared to give my time, I need to be sure that you will do whatever it is it takes to kind of respond to the suggestions and that you'll take them in good faith. If I tell you your writing is bad, go and figure out with me or without me, as the case may be, how to improve it. But don't get annoyed or upset. It doesn't move us forward. Um, and honestly, I, I almost say I, I feel I haven't had the time to do it properly, so I haven't done it properly. 
and therefore in return it, I have acknowledged the comments of many people that I haven't done enough to mentor people. I haven't spent time encouraging people. And I've said to myself, okay, I will do a few sessions like this, which I hope will provide some mentorship to some. And I do now talk to sort of small groups of people from time to time to try and discuss with them what their problems are and see if there are any things that I can say to them that will help. I do know people are struggling on all sorts of levels, so I'm hoping that you know there are things that I can say that might make a difference to their lives. Talking about people struggling, a lot of young girls, I knew I, 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 I had a mortal fear of litigation. <laughs> what, what can be done to you know, uh, make them be at ease? Or what, what would you say to your lawyers who are uh, feeling like misfits, they don't want to, they don't know whether to litigate or if they don't litigate, well, how else would they be able to join, be a, co be a corporate? Or... Mm -hmm. it, it's funny, I've never thought that a corporate lawyer has to be a litigator. It can help, but you definitely don't have to be. I can think of so many corporate lawyers who I'm pretty certain do not litigate. Litigation gives you a particular perspective. And although UUBO has a litigation department, in a sense, we can almost be at odds on things. You know, the perspective of a, of a litigator is whenever there's a problem, we're going to court. Sometimes it's completely unhelpful. So I don't discount the skills of a litigator, but I don't always think they are useful and not necessarily useful in the corporate sphere. So that's sort of one thing I think about. And the other is that for lawyers, there are so many things you can do without being a litigator. And without being a litigator, I mean, you can go into technology law. You can, I think there's a developing area of health law. You can be a corporate lawyer in the strict sense of somebody who advises corporations on corporate law matters. Mm. Or you can be the kind of advisor who provides advice on business law matters. There's, there are so many options in growing. With the passage of the um, Petroleum Bill, for example, it's now an act, isn't it? The Petroleum Act. Just think of all the work that is going to come out of that. In a bond thing, that In a thing, thing yes. That, yes. You know, the whole power sector is going to shift radically. Are people beginning to think of how they can fit into that? Yes, you can advise a company. Yes, you can decide you are going to be the gas lawyer of the future. You can think about technology in the power sphere. You don't have to be a litigator to do any of these things. All you have to do is to be able to understand the law and apply it, preferably with clarity. Because the other thing about some, and you know, litigated lawyers can sometimes do this a lot, they like using words. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry oh, to everybody out there who's going to be annoyed, but you know, big words, and you, because you're trying to impress and frighten and intimidate the other side. I think good corporate lawyers are actually very clear and very simple. This is what the law is. You have four options, decide which one you are taking based on your business. That's kind of how I think we should be thinking. So in a sense, I sideline litigation completely when it comes to that kind of clarity. I don't think we always get it from litigation lawyers. I, I, I spoke to uh, one or two other people and they said, you know, they, they, they recommend that when, when people come into uh, practice, spend the first five years, mm -hmm. In doing all going going around all the departments is that is that is that something you people practice in your view as well? well for young when the young lawyers came in yes absolutely absolutely it's always good to have a sense of what kind of um, is done in each department within your firm but also it allows you then to make your choices as to what you'd like to focus on ultimately I don't think lawyers are going to ever really be good i mean we have to have a good general sense of the law in several areas but i think that to be really useful to your law firm you should also specialize in a couple of things you should develop a deep knowledge about two or three areas possibly and you can't know what you like until you've actually tried it 
For you, what are those areas? What, 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 what did you enjoy doing mostly in the um, for sector? I'd, I'd say in some respects, um, I'm just trying, I, 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 okay, I'm not going to prioritize. I enjoy telecommunications law. I, I enjoyed that. Uh, in part because we had an extremely, at the time, good regulator in the NCC. And when I say a good regulator, you could go to them and say, look, my client is thinking of doing X. Under the law, this is what we think is possible. There may or may not be a license for this, but what do you think? And you'd go up to Abuja in those days and you'd sit down and you'd have a meeting with them and they discuss it with you, we don't agree, we agree, we'll come back to you. Excellent. I don't know what the current situation is, but it made the practice of telecommunications law at the time really enjoyable because you could, you could engage without the regulator treating you as if you were the yeah. enemy. Exactly. You know what I mean? And I mean, my sense from a distance, since I, I haven't practiced for a couple of years, is that we don't have that many regulators who are able to be confident enough in themselves to have that kind of an engagement with a lawyer who comes to them. I enjoyed oil and gas when I did it. It's been a while, but I did enjoy it at the time. And then I enjoyed banking and finance. Um, but, you know, we, we, we had an interesting situation at one point when my husband um, became, what for want of a better word, might be a banker. As you may know, he would you be here at the time. Um, and our banking practice literally fell off a cliff. People just adopted the attitude of, ah, your husband is at UBA, we can't give you our banking and finance work. And that was almost 60% of UBA's work. So we literally lost about 60% of our business and had to start building up our practice again and for me it was useful that i was somewhat international because i was like okay clearly i'm not going to get any business within nigeria it, it came back but let me start looking internationally which are the international banking and finance institutions that i should be talking about and that's kind of how we rebuilt we rebuilt our practice with the help of my partners who were very good to me because they could have adopted the approach of See your, what your halal has caused, uh, you know. Collateral damage. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Young lawyers will look up to people like you and say, how do I walk our path? You know, um, is there a way you can put it in words for a, a young lawyer who wants to walk the path and get to score the way you have in, in corporate law? What, 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 what do they need to do? Just come out of school with a good degree and join it at the firm? Or Maybe there are secrets. I, I don't know about secrets. Or tips. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to suggest a few tips, but we also acknowledge that you know sometimes you're very blessed. Um, but I, I mean, it has to start with hard work. It has to. I, I worry a little bit about our legal education at the mm. moment. Mm. I, I don't think we are serving our young lawyers as well as we should. And I think that there are definitely changes to the legal curriculum that could improve the lot of our lawyers. And, and we've discussed in recent times the fact, for example, that it would not be a bad thing for lawyers to study entrepreneurship and innovation in a way, because this grounds a lot of business and so on and so forth for the future. But if you as a lawyer want to set up your law firm and run it as a firm rather than as a passion, you have to know how to run a firm. It's a business like any other business. Mm -hmm. And you know, the one tip that I would give from that perspective is as somebody who did not like mathematics and such like things, for heaven's sake, I better go and learn <laughs> a little bit of business, understand how to run your firm. There's a profit, there's a loss, you know, mix the two. Uh, you know, so that's a, a marginal tip. But I think the thing is to really, um, decide that you want to be an expert at something and really spend your time working at it. Take the comments, take the criticism, and, 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 and learn to be confident in your abilities. I, I, I'm not comfortable with people who 
you know, will talk a lot, but when you actually start examining what they're saying, some of it is inaccurate, some of it is half truth, it's a lot of big words, go and study it and then come back and let's have a discussion about it. this is what the law says, but we can interpret it differently. So another thing I'd say to people is really decide what you want to do and, and work with it, study it, become an expert in something. It doesn't necessarily have to be in the whole of Kama. It can be in some niche part of Kama. That's a skill. You know, not all doctors are general surgeons. There's somebody who can be just a hand surgeon. There are skills that you can learn. Um, in some ways, the Nigerian labor market is small, but I think that this is the way of the future. Much as we have to have the ability to cover many topics, we also have to begin to learn to specialize. Um, I think that we have to also develop a clear moral code for ourselves, mm. a sense of not just integrity, a sense of what is it that we are willing to draw the line at. The example I'll give from my own perspective is when we were talking, Idoma and I, at the beginning of our journey together. One of the things he made very clear, I, I, you, you, you didn't practice, I know you're a lawyer, <laughs> but you didn't practice, but there was, especially in the banking and finance world many years ago, this habit of if you got a, a, an assignment or a brief from a bank, often you were expected to share your fees with the person who had instructed you. Um, Idoma's view was this is completely inappropriate not acceptable you will never do it and i bought into that and much as it was a struggle we lost all sorts of assignments that we knew we knew we were going to be really good at we just had to accept that this was the line we had drawn in our sand we were not going to do this and we, we haven't done it and we've survived so i think for all lawyers i would say decide what you can't do and what you shouldn't do, and then go with that. The, the, the difficulty that many face is that we are in an environment where so much is allowed to happen that is wrong. Uh, people are frightened to comment. Uh, people don't feel the ability to comment. Um, so it allows people to do things that may not be right and get away with it. But, you know, once you slide, there's, you no, keep, there's, no, there's end, no end, there's no end to it. Yeah. So it's something that you have to make a decision on pretty early. So that's another thing I, I would think about. Having a very firm philosophy, this is what guides, uh, you guides know, your life yes. and your work. Yes. And a lot of that can be grounded in faith. If you're Muslim, if you're Christian, there are certain things. Because it rolls through they, it's all It's life. Yes, this yes. is your life. You have to decide, am I going to do this, am I not? So that's another thing. Um, I, I, I think perhaps the other thing that strikes me from time to time is the journey for women in particular. And I always like to speak about this, obviously, because I'm a woman. And my background has been so supportive that I know I have avoided or not been subject to some of the things that young associates are subjected to in many law firms. I'm hopeful that nobody in UBO was ever subjected to sexual harassment. I've never heard about it. We come down hard on it, assuming, you know, we make it very clear that this is an issue. So by God's grace, it hasn't happened and I didn't know. But a lot of people are suffering and struggling with issues of sexual harassment. And I, I don't understand men who think it's okay to do this, but I feel horribly sorry for women who feel that this is the only way to make progress in their lives. I mean, this is a, a dilemma that nobody should have to go through. It really saddens me. So. I speak to you know young ladies and say, in a sense, you have to decide. What is your view of success? Is your success going to be, I must be in this law firm and be a partner? Or what? Are you prepared to do anything to get there? If not, think about 
doing something else. And I, I, I can't say I can offer you a job or anything of that nature, but I can try and support you through this journey. But don't, don't allow yourself to be used. Don't allow yourself, your life to be compromised by this feeling that I must do this. And, and it leads to, I think, another thing that I, I, I worry about from time to time. What is your definition of success? For some people, success is making money. You know, we're in an environment where for a lot of people that is... Especially for young people now, it's about... You it's see about Hush money. Puppy and they, you know, yes. that is... That is... <laughs> but, but is that success? Uh, for other people, it's academic success. You know, we, again, you know, one of the sad things in Nigeria is that we've forgotten that academic success is an amazing achievement. Think of all the time it takes to get to the top really to the top of your profession in whatever it is you know that and I, I you know is a kind of success I would really love to have in a sense I'd love to be a really good academic and acknowledged for that and then you know what other types of success are there success in being a leader of a firm that's a success in a way but you have to decide what 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 is it you want what is it that for you would mean success and I think that's another thing that people kind of need to think about early so they plot their path in that direction. And you're, you're going to ask me what my <laughs> success was. <laughs> Leading one of the best law firms in Nigeria. That was my view of success. Fantastic. And, and you have indeed. I uh, like to think so. And then when we were talking earlier as well, you talked about your writing skills mm -hmm. uh, and you have been admitted uh, into the American Academy of uh, Letters. Yeah. Third Nigerian, mm -hmm. uh, so to speak. Uh, how how does that make you feel? Is that is that part of the successes that you? <laughs> <laughs> well, to the extent that I don't know how I got there, no. I mean, I, I I am actually not entirely sure what it was that that got me there. And I have a feeling it had more to do with um, it had more to do with philanthropy in a sense than it did to do with my academic skills so i'm not sure that that is there's still time are you ever going to probably walk back into uni like and say i want to do some kind of part-time teaching <laughs> 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 or, or, do, or go to the pan-african university or, or something, something and, like and, and just impact well i am now a somewhat lazy grandmother so <laughs> I, I think that whatever it is i do has to be something that isn't defined by semesters i don't want to be tied down and having to give lectures and not able to travel if my grandchild somewhere needs me. So that's in a sense what I'd like to do. But to contribute to improving the, um, the quality of legal teaching, I think is something that I would like to do. And in a sense, I feel I have a responsibility to do. I do have a bit of time. I do, I think, have some skill that could work towards that. And that's something that I, I think I'd like to get involved in. What has kept you? What would you consider the major thing that has kept you in, in the law practice? Well, a combination of things. One, obviously, that was my profession. Uh, as I said, I wanted to build, help build an institution that stayed. So these are all reasons why you would stick with something. But I think also because, as I mentioned, I think law is pretty fundamental. You know, if the, 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 the real understanding of law, in the sense I mean it, that you have rights, you have responsibilities, it helps form, shape, and ground a society. I think that's another thing that I think should be a running theme through all our lives. I mean, we all misbehave at various points in time, but fundamentally, what keeps us together is the law. So I think that that has to be almost an abiding theme in all our minds. Even if it's not front of mind, it, it, it's always something that undergirds everything we do. And, and, and what else would have kept me in practice? I, I think if I felt there were not other things that I would like to do, perhaps I might have stayed on. And in a sense, I... I have because we regard ourselves as of counsel. If the law firm requires us to do something, obviously you know, we'll, we'll go in and do it. Um, but 
for those reasons, I, I, I'll, I'll remain engaged, I think. And in a sense, I, I feel a certain responsibility to help people um, who are interested in law practice. Not necessarily litigation, but practice. If you had a chance to do this all over again, is there something you want to do differently? Weirdly enough, no. I wouldn't say I think there's perfection, but I think I have sufficiently enjoyed the most part of the journey that I would perhaps go exactly the same route. Um, I've thought about that a lot over the years. Would anything have changed? And uh, no, I, I actually don't think so. I think I've been very blessed, I'm lucky. And um, although I don't know what lessons there are in that for anybody listening to me, I, I think I'm, I'm happy at what I, I, at the path I took. You use the word blessed a lot, but um, because I've spoken to two other big wigs and their trajectory, mm -hmm. you know, um, I want to see if I can locate a thread with you. Would you say that your education sort of prepared you to the point where you could boycott every other thing and just come into Nigeria and start a partnership uh, law firm without having to go through um, Chris Ogubanjo, mm -hmm. who, that was the premier um, uh, corporate law okay, firm, okay. firm at, mm -hmm. at the time? Well, in a sense, that was done for me because Senator Odomo was at Chris Ogubanjo briefly. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. okay. So, so it still goes back. It still goes back to, the, to, to it, Yeah. So, you know, Chris Ogubanjo was an amazing force when you think of the number of people who went through his law firm. But I think because I was coming as a foreigner, my, my path is very different. I, I studied law in Ghana, at the University of Ghana, and you are required as part of studying law to intern with various law firms. And I happened to intern with a gentleman who was um, a, a civil procedure guru at the time. And the odd thing about him is that he had taken over a chambers that was set up by my uncle, who was a lawyer, became quite a well-known judge and became chief justice in Zambia many, many years ago. So it was named after my sort of step-grandmother. Okay, but you know, he, he, he was a very tough, disciplined person. I learned a lot from him. He was very much a litigation lawyer, but because he did civil procedure, he was also the sort of person who was very concerned that you understand the consequences of things that you did. So I, I would not put him in the same league as Christopher Manjo. He was in no way, shape or form a real business lawyer, but he was somebody who um, shaped, I think, the thinking of many people. He did lecture in our, our, our law faculty as well. So one absorbed a lot from him. But what would the educational steps be? Well, going to um, America for me was a journey, a way to expand my horizons, a way to think beyond my, my physical borders, um, a way to understand how law could be taught slightly differently from what I was used to because the system of instruction in Harvard Law School was very much uh, what they call the Socratic method. You're being asked questions, you're being challenged, you're being forced to think mm -hmm. in a more critical way, I think, than we had been taught, and that I think is what is done here, where you absorb, you don't necessarily challenge. So that, for me, was another learning curve. And then seeing the institutional law firms in America was also actually for me pretty interesting because these were firms some of which had lasted for years and I was kind of like gosh that is possible you know it's not what I was used to at home and I thought this is great that's kind of what I'd like to do so all of these are building blocks along a journey that I took so that's why I say less in the sense that not everybody has the same opportunities, but I would hope that when people have them, that they grab them 
and make the most of those opportunities for themselves. And can translate <coughs> into their own into society. Their own society. I, I see you, 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 you sort of serve in the Harvard... Um, on the, in, they, they have an Africa, a center in Africa studies, yes, yes. and also they have a global advisory board, board yes, that yes. Uh, both I and my husband sit on. Um, well, Harvard is, you know, you will always try and support whichever institution you feel has done something for you. I, I apart from my primary school, <laughs> I think <laughs> I continue to try and support my secondary school, which is Achimota Secondary Year. Achimota. Oh, Achimota. Yes. And um, my university, I think I may have more treated, and I say my university in the sense of the University of Ghana, they, gone. they gave me a scholarship. I mean, when I went to Harvard, Ghana was going through an incredibly difficult economic period and you couldn't you couldn't transfer money so there was no way my parents were going to be able to pay for my education the University of Ghana gave me a scholarship three quarters of the time we didn't have money to transfer I actually ended up not graduating at the same time as my year group partly because um, they hadn't paid my fees so I had to work a little bit in order to make the final payment of my, of my school fees. And these were all things I, I hadn't had to deal with at home. You know, your father can pay your fees, he can pay your fees, but you know, suddenly you're having to work and pay your fees and not sure if the next sort of scholarship money will come and saying to yourself, okay, what am I going to do to make sure that this doesn't happen again? Um, the challenge for me toughened me. I think it was very good for me because I was a bit of a, uh, a sport child in some respects. So I, I think I learned a lot from that experience. Um, so for me it helps in the sense that when I came here and I was going through some of the challenges I was alluding to, you kept reminding yourself you've been through was built for this. some of this. <laughs> you know, you've, you've dealt with it, you've survived. What is it that anybody can do that is going to kill you? It was that sort of approach. Um, and I had the additional um, challenge that I, I, I guess I'm somewhat amused by now. But when I was getting married to my husband, I had a delegation of aunties. My, my father had passed away. And I had a delegation of aunties who went to meet my mom. I said, this is a terrible idea. Mm. They listed literally everybody who was Ghanaian who had been married to a Nigerian and had come back home and said to her, is this what you want? I mean, check the data. <laughs> <laughs> Very scientific. You know, this was what they said. Based they said, on empirical they evidence. They came with a list. <laughs> so I, I, my additional challenge was to say, I'm going to try and make sure that I I, I, I go back home showing that I have survived a marriage. And as I said, it, because I had such an amazing husband, it helped. But, you know, there were challenges that I had to cope with. And I, I think they helped me become a somewhat tougher person than I thought I could be. And this, in a sense, may be a lesson for people that un until you are challenged, you don't know what your capabilities or your abilities or your strengths are. And sometimes you have to step out your, of your comfort zone in order to make sure that you can meet those challenges. You know, you don't like public speaking. Okay, suddenly you're being forced. You know, God has interesting ways of, of dealing with, uh, with things. I, I, I don't like public speaking. It's another, you asked me about some of the reasons why I haven't spoken before, and that's one of the things that I always say to people. Um, but suddenly, you keep getting asked and you have to say to yourself so is this god's way of saying to you for god's sake get up out of this chair it's stop time. being lazy go and do something useful in the world so you know this 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 may be what he's saying but meeting challenges going out of your comfort zone these are i think important things for everybody to to try and do i i, I like i like to find little uh, quirks or ironies in life. Uh, 
you know the series what what they don't teach you in Harvard. Yes. <laughs> in your case, what they did teach you in Harvard, you learned in I Harvard. Learned. <laughs> <laughs> you learned what well being in Harvard. You know, uh, well trying so. to you know make sure that your fees was paid. I do want, by the way, to just make another comment. You asked me about Harvard. And one of the things that I think we as Africans don't always focus on or recognize is two things. One is that people don't always realize the depth of competence in Africa. And Africa as a whole, Nigeria, Ghana, etc. There are so many people who are really Good at what they do and who if given the opportunity would shine look i mean our athletes are an example but one of the things we've been concerned about is that the african voice is not often heard in circles where it it should shine like anybody else and we have um sought to encourage harvard to set up what we'd call a business series where we ask African business leaders to come and speak mm. at a Harvard forum. Because sometimes they, the challenges that they have had to deal with, you know, you're dealing with really fundamental challenges of infrastructure, of, you know, a lack of a workforce that you can easily train, of regulatory challenges, left, right, and center, of policy shifts, every single day and you are functioning and you haven't gone mad and you are still going strong and so on and so forth. So one of our things with Albert is that you should hear more yeah, African, African perspective, voice. Yes. Okay, yes. so yes, we are there, but we are not necessarily the best. We are the ones who happen to have gone to Harvard. So this is something that we would like to see more of. Let more people come to speak to them. So we do it at Harvard. Um, we've tried to do something at Yale we haven't done it with Princeton where third, we, 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 we decided in each school where we had had children we should try and do something that tries to project a little bit more of Africa into. Both of us happened to go to Harvard, so kind of that was natural. We had a daughter who went to Yale, so we did that. Um, we haven't done much with Princeton, we'll try and do it, but Stanford also, um, where my husband sits on an advisory board as well, you know. Take Africa out. We have a voice. We need to speak. The thing also that we tend to forget as Africans and Nigerians is because we have grown up in this environment where in some ways you know that if you work hard, you can be anything you want. You can succeed at anything you want. That confidence is incredible because you go out and you meet people in other environments who are black and there's a certain insecurity about the way they approach life. The Ghanaian and Nigerian never thinks I cannot be a doctor. Mm. What do you mean? It's just that my parents didn't pay the fees That's all. or cannot pay the fees. You know, but you will find somebody who by God's grace will help you. You will get there. So the challenge is more to get into the institution. You will make it. Some people are not sure that they can get into the institution, whether they can pay the fees or not. It's a very powerful thing we have. And we need to send that confidence out in the world and encourage others. And we see that when people go to other countries, they shine. Well, it's you know. the can-do spirit. I, I, in fact, it would be nice to interrogate, interrogate the, the can-do spirit mm -hmm. of the average Nigerian. Or oh, body, definitely. Uh, and see what it is. Is it in our DNA or is it, is it how over the generations, how our parents and brothers are like, you can do you it. Can do you it. Know, I might not have the means to give you everything you need, but if you do find the need, you can. You, you will fly. You know, it, it's, an, it's an incredible thing, and it's something that we should be building on. Part of the frustration of my generation is this is, a, you know, something that should have lifted by, us. By now, by yes. Now. yes. And, and kind of feel that what happened, it's all being whittled away, and I don't want to die feeling that we, we, we haven't built on this. And since I'm heading for old age, I'm a little distressed. And maybe that is also part of the thing that makes me feel I should participate more in, in a discussion. I'm never going to be a politician, 
But I, I, I want to be able to say to people, these are things that we can do better. Tiny space, but make it one where you are excelling. Because that excelling hopefully will draw people up as you move up. And these little pots of excellence will hopefully gather together and build a much better society for all of us. That's one of the things that I'd really hope for. Somebody once asked me, like, you know, what's, what's, what's the one lesson life has taught you? And I, I usually draw from my mom mm -hmm. because my mom would always say to me that um, just keep it simple, son, you know, keep it simple. And, and, and I find that that has really been my, like my, my underlying philosophy. Mm -hmm. um, I, I picked up a few things on the way. Um, from Delegiwa, my late wife, I, I learned um, living well is the best revenge. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, uh, so three, three pillars for me, actually. Maybe I'll find a way to uh, synthesize it all and then come up with one liner. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the third one is my mom would say, what I can't provide you, you don't need. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so maybe when you are old enough, you can provide for yourself. Right. So the same principles that I brought my kids up with, you know, um, keep it simple. If I can't provide it for you right now, that means you don't need it. Uh, when you get older, you can provide things for yourself. <laughs> A good <laughs> yeah. one. And then live well, mm -hmm. you know, uh, as, as your own revenge on life, mm -hmm. which, which is very similar to if life gives you that much. You I got drink tequila, drink tequila, yeah. tequila make lemonade. <laughs> <laughs> I heard that one. He said, "Drink tequila." Yeah. <laughs> yes, actually, change it for the better. Yeah, I, I, I don't have a pithy one liner, but I, I like to see everybody have the ability to fulfill their potential. Potential will never be the same. You know, you can have somebody who has Down syndrome they may not be able to do what somebody without Down syndrome can do, but they have some potential. I have a young nephew who has Down syndrome and has won gold medals at the Paralympics. I just love it, you know, I, I praise him, I celebrate him. You know, others will see him and see, uh, and you say, no, this is a, he has an Olympic medal. Yeah. Yeah, the limitations are the ones you place on yeah. yourself. Yes. So just make the best of everything you have, but just keep building on all the potential that you have. And, you know, your version of success will always be your own version. But whatever it is, strive for it. And I think that, that that is important. Thank you so much. Uh, it, it's been an amazing um, uh, journey for you, uh, I must say. And, you know, just reading about you and now having opportunity to engage with you you know uh, it's been really very wonderful thank you, thank you so much for coming uh, on big week so we must wrap this up here at this point we can go on and on and on and not not stop today uh, from the very University of Legon in Ghana to the hallowed chambers of Harvard University in America we have been talking to no other than Dr. Maima Ajwa Belosagi. I hope you have found this as engaging and exciting as we have here. Until the next time when we bring you another big week. My name is Richard Mufeda Pigeon. And we are out. I'm a big week. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I need to run things up. Yeah, 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 yeah. We're making great moves. Big moves. Yeah, yeah. I'm a lawyer, I love the practice so My daily moves, nothing but magic I'm a lawyer, but I don't even go to court My daily moves, nothing but magic